Number 10, Lex Luthor. Imagine your long distant son, who you were finally gaining ground with, is killed by a giant seven foot clone of himself. And then his psycho grandpa steals his body and puts it in a sarcophagus alongside a chaos crystal, which leads to the villains from Apocalypse coming and fighting you for it. Now, imagine your friends show up and start intervening, unintentionally blocking you from stopping the villains from stealing your son's body. How absolutely fuming might you be? That's kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? Well, basically, after the Shazam and Justice League aligned Lex Luthor tried justifying this, Batman lets both of them know why they should keep their mouths shut and not insert themselves into conflicts they know nothing about. Batman gets three good punches across Shazam's face, leaving him shocked and embarrassed, and then knocks Lex Luthor on his butt with a nice stiff punch, hurting his ego and his face. Number nine, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. As with almost all comics that take heroes from two different universes and throw them together, those heroes have to fight at least a little bit before they can join forces. It's just tradition at this point. So, of course, in 2016, when we see Batman team up with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a little scuffle has to take place. Oh, also, if you thought this kind of team up would be silly, yeah, maybe. But it's totally awesome. In their scuffle in the second issue of the comic, Batman basically makes them look like amateurs. They end up hitting each other, being stunned by the Batmobile, having their weapons taken and used against them. Michelangelo starts to get some kind of conversation going before Splinter shows up and splinters the fight. It is super cool and so is this comic. Give it a read. Cowabunga, dude. Hey there, nerds. Did you know that every time you hit that like and subscribe button, my appreciation of you grows by four? For what? I don't know. I just work here. Anyways, keep whacking those buttons for more spicy content. Number eight, Nightwing. You know, I think Batman needs to kind of ease up on just punching people instead of talking. Sure, it gets stuff done, but then you end up crying at the Oscars while accepting your best actor award, so. When Batman first comes into contact with the Court of Owls, the members have special seals hidden in their mouths. The first Robin, now going by Nightwing, could possibly be one of them, as his great grandfather is. So, how does Batman figure out if his old partner, longtime friend, and member of the Bat family is still loyal? Well, um, after a bit of lip from Dick Grayson, Batman punches Nightwing right in the mouth and knocks out his tooth to check. He was supposed to be a Talon of the Court of Owls, but he clearly isn't. Remind me never to become a Robin, okay? Number seven, Green Arrow. Green Arrow and Batman have had a few scuffles before, and on the last list, we learned he isn't even considered a threat by Batman, really. Things kind of get taken to another level, though, in Superman Batman issue 14 in 2005, Pretenders to the Throne. Batman and Superman have become villains and rule over the country. Batman brings Superman to Green Arrow as a sick, twisted birthday present so they can pummel him together. Green Lantern actually gets soups with a kryptonite arrow, which seems to only make Batman more angry. And after a hit with the bow, he completely lays into Green Arrow. That is, until Superman completely disintegrates him with his heat vision. Yikes. You know, maybe this is more sadistic than embarrassing. Number six, Spawn. In 1994, Spawn was a powerhouse of money making. Now take that character and stick him in a comic with arguably one of the most popular characters ever, Batman, and you've got an instant success. While it may have been over the top ridiculously violent, it's still an awesome comic. As we said before, any team up has to have a little scuffle between the two main heroes. And this was one hell of a scuffle. It was brutal and violent. While it may have ended in a draw, during the fight, Batman actually ended up stabbing Spawn in the face with a battering. The scar from this attack made its way into mainline Spawn comics, while Batman, while Batman walked away without as much as a scratch. Fight Batman, and he'll give you a scar even your fans have to remember. Number five, the Justice League. In Justice League Doom, the animated movie, Batman is being scolded by the other members of the Justice League for having contingencies to immobilize each member of the League. They are deciding if they should make him leave the Justice League for this. Batman just kind of helps them decide. If you people can't see the potential danger of an out of control Justice League, I don't need to wait for a vote. I don't belong here. And he just walks out of there. Superman goes to him and asks what his contingency for Batman himself was, 
and he says, the Justice League. As someone on Reddit said, Batman is a hundred percent right in this fight. Batman quit on his own terms, Batman built the Justice League's watchtower and has a deep understanding of how it works, and Batman left the watchtower to them, despite having designed, funded, and built it. Number 4. The Flash The Justice League animated TV show in 2001. After the somewhat newly formed Justice League become fugitives, running and hiding from the Thanagarian troops, they take shelter in a department store. They come up with the solution of trading in their superhero costumes for regular street clothes to disguise themselves. This is when Flash pipes up, trying to voice his opinion about the whole secret identity thing. Batman cuts him off, walking right up to him, pointing at each member who has a secret identity and straight up just saying their real names. Clark Kent, Wally West, Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Shut up, Flash! Number 3. Aquaman Okay, look. Aquaman does have some serious power. And in recent years, he's gotten a hell of a lot better. Partially thanks to Jason Momoa. But this story? Well, it really doesn't make him look good. In Legends of the DC Universe number 27, the Joker goes to Atlantis and convinces everyone there, including Aquaman, that he is the king of the land. Aquaman even admits he's heard of Joker before from Batman, but that he just doesn't pay attention. Aquaman goes to the surface, where he suddenly has trouble walking, can't figure out how to contact Batman, and he gets pepper sprayed. Then, Batman shows up and says no to helping Aquaman, so Aquaman attacks him. This gives us a full three page spread of Batman completely beating the gills off of Aquaman. Which is even more embarrassing when you realize Aquaman has actual powers. Number 2. Martian Manhunter Okay, this is a short little moment, but it shows us a side to Bruce Wayne I don't think any of us knew existed. In JLA issue number 27 in 1999, there is a single page. Bruce Wayne is meeting with Clark Kent and a mystery woman who Clark introduces as Hino Ray, And she greets Bruce. In the very next panel, we find out that this woman is actually John Johns, the Martian Manhunter, in disguise. How? Well, Batman says that while the accent was flawless, the name was a dead giveaway. Now this may fly right over your head, it did for me at first, but Ray Hino is the name of Sailor Mars from Sailor Moon. That means that Batman, Bruce Wayne, billionaire and mass detective vigilante who has mortally wounded characters like Darkseid and beats criminals to a pulp with his bare hands, watches Sailor Moon. So does Martian Manhunter for that fact. Is it embarrassing? Up to you. But what? Number 1. Judge Dredd In the Batman vs Judge Dredd comic that ended up putting Batman in the world of 2000 AD's most famous character, Judge Dredd, Batman is arrested and taken to the Hall of Justice for being a vigilante and carrying around all the tech and weaponry that Batman does. Judge Dredd refuses to ally with Bruce to fight Judge Death, who is going to Gotham and will kill everyone there and on that earth, saying that 1. He is going to put Bruce away for 20 years for his crimes, and 2. That Gotham is out of their jurisdiction. Bruce loses it and busts out of his bonds and starts to wail on the judge. Assaulting a judge? That's 10 years in prison! Make it 20, Bruce yells as he kicks Dredd in the face. And it's 10, Superman. The Dark Multiverse is a mysterious dimension. It lies outside of the normal universe. In one of the many universes in the Dark Dimension, Superman went rogue and killed off every hero and villain. No one could actually stop him. The last remaining hero was, of course, Batman, who could not even believe that his best friend could have done all this. But Batman had a plan. A fail safe. <laughs> Surprise. He had studied Doomsday's body and created a virus that could turn himself into a version. Batman then became Doomsday, killed Superman, and then decided to spread this virus all over the earth, turning everyone into a form of Doomsday. Which not only humiliates Superman, but also kind of embarrasses Batman himself. I mean, like, he probably went nuts because of the whole, like, he was part Doomsday thing, but still. In a 9 Calabac. Batman had gone toe to toe with the new gods on two occasions prior to the new 52, in Comic Odyssey and Final Crisis, respectively. But this time he came with a vengeance. In the wake of Damian Wayne's death, in the finale of Batman Inc., Bruce happens upon Ra's al Ghul's attempt to resurrect his son in a Lazarus pit, along with his former lover Talia. He prevents the head of the demon from bringing them back to life, as they would emerge as Ra's servants. But before they can actually, like, stop Damien's body from being resurrected, his body gets snatched, and his dead son is ripped from Batman's grasp. And then, this guy heads back to Apocalypse. This leads Batman to deploy the Hellbat armor and venture all the way to Apocalypse to retrieve his son, and in the process, ends up fighting 
Darkseid and Kalibak, the Lord of Apocalypse's faithful son. In it ain't White Martians. Grant Morrison's Justice League run features the world falling under attack from the villainous White Martians, and it's up to the Justice League, obviously, to stop them. Also, like in the cartoons version of this story, the decisive blow is finally dealt by Batman, who is so badly underestimated by the White Martians because he lacks the superpowers of his fellow teammates. The White Martians managed to capture all of the Justice League and assumed that Batman was killed when they shot down the Batwing. However, the Dark Knight had survived the wreckage because of his plot armor and deduced that they were just as susceptible to fire as Martian Manhunter, due to the fact that they didn't come near his burning plane. Batman swoops in, sets everything on fire like a pointy-eared human torch, and saves his teammates. Another lesson in why you should never underestimate him, which reminds me of when like Oliver Queen shot all the Dominators with their own gun in the Invasion crossover on the CW after escaping Dreamworld, which is still one of my favorite Arrow episodes. And it's Seventh Cersei. Amazon's Attack was a short crossover that released in the build-up to Final Crisis. The comic saw Cersei manipulate the Amazons into invading the United States, believing that Wonder Woman had been detained by the Department of Metahuman Affairs, which wouldn't really make sense given that she's an Amazon and not a Metahuman, but anyway. The Justice League was sent in response, or chose to go on their own at least, and wouldn't you guess it, Batman is right in the front lines. The Amazon Attacks crossover sees the sorceress underestimate Batman and suffer embarrassment as a result. Batman enlists the help of Zatanna to defeat Cersei, and the League's prominent magician casts a spell on the Wonder Woman adversary that renders her powerless for a short period of time, allowing for the Dark Knight to get the drop on her and lay the groundwork for Wonder Woman to swoop in and deliver the final blow. In its six, Deathstroke. When it comes to comics, Batman and Deathstroke have faced off with each other on many occasions, with no definitive results going one way or the other. One of the most recent battles in the aptly titled Batman vs. Deathstroke comic saw the two fight into a stalemate. It's a fitting conclusion with a duel between the world's greatest detective and the world's deadliest assassin. Bats and Deathstroke then fought each other on top of a cable car dangling over Gotham Harbor. And just as when it seems as though Slade has gotten the upper hand, the Cape Crusader is able to ensnare him with his grapple gun and save the hostage position nearby. At least in the short-lived Beware the Batman animated series, which was released for one season in 2013. Deathstroke may be one of the deadliest figures in the DC Universe, but that didn't stop Batman from giving this Terminator reject his just desserts. Halfway through into number 5, Darkseid. Bruce Wayne was at first not really taken seriously by Darkseid. As a matter of fact, Batman uses the element of being underestimated as like his greatest superpower, basically. Batman doesn't kill, but he was forced to kill when Darkseid threatened Earth. The only known substance that could kill a new god is Radeon, so Batman shot Darkseid with a Radeon bullet and caused himself to die in the process. Darkseid, for that matter, had Batman as the last person in mind that could actually stop him. He thought if anybody was going to kill him, it would be Clark Kent, so yeah. Up until this point, the only human or sentient being, for that matter, that is truly made Darkseid, the god of evil in the DC Universe, cower and run away is Batman. <laughs> in it for a reverse flash. A pride point for basically all speedsters, especially evil speedsters, is how fast they can move, how they're faster than a speeding bullet, and how they're basically impossible to hit. So imagine our surprise when reverse flash ends up getting popped in the head by none other than Thomas Wayne in the Flashpoint timeline, so that Barry Allen could access enough speed force to save the world and bring his son back. And while this apparently killed Thawne, that was far from it. Thawne actually started vibrating as fast as he could to slow the destruction of his brain. This actually gave Thawne more time to try and avoid death, or to try and find a way to do so, and gave him the ability to hold quite the grudge. Humiliated by getting killed by Batman, of all people, Thawne sets out to be even worse than usual, even ripping up the letter that Thomas Wayne gave to Barry to give to Bruce, the only contact that Bruce has had with his parents since they died. The only contact with a living version, which is absolutely brutal. Batman was like ugly crying and ooh, it, it was not pretty. Getting close to the end of number three, The Riddler. Batman Universe is an absolute gem of a comic. The series spotlights Batman in a time-traveling, universe-spanning adventure that takes him all the way from present-day Gotham to Thanagar, then back in time to the Wild West where he meets Jonah Hex, and then all the way back to the present again. The series starts off somewhat innocuously, however. It's kind of simple, with a confrontation with The Riddler. Only Batman can tell that something isn't quite right. The Riddler's riddle this time was simply, when is the Riddler not the Riddler? And both the Dark Knight and Alfred agree that this is way below Nygma's usual standard. After chasing Riddler down and asking why he's stolen a priceless Fabergé egg, Batman also expresses concern at Nygma's behavior. It comes off as sincere concern, but there's an element of condescension in there as well about how Riddler just isn't 
riddling like he used to, or, and honestly, he's trash at the moment, basically. And it's even more obvious that this is kind of Batman's tone when Green Arrow shows up and Batman literally says, you're embarrassing yourself in front of Green Arrow. Are you feeling all right? Which is kind of a dig at both Enigma and Oliver. But ultimately, in at number two, the Justice League. The Justice Buster Batsuit is a mech suit part of Batman's Fenrir contingency, designed to take down the entirety of the Justice League, making its feature appearance in Batman Endgame. When the Joker used his virus to warp the brains of the Justice League as the beginning of his Endgame plot, Batman was forced to use the Fenrir protocol to eliminate his teammates. The suit was successful in eliminating Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Aquaman, but met an even match at the hands of Superman. After a lengthy fight, Superman tore through the armor and nearly killed Batman until Bruce used kryptonite chewing gum and spit it in Clark's face, rendering him unconscious. Come on! Like, imagine waking up to learn that you passed out because Batman spit on your face. Like, seriously, bro, please, brush your tongue when you brush your teeth. Your breath is absolutely lethal. Not to mention the miniaturized red suns for knuckles, ancient Greek supernatural weaponry, super fast servers, and electromagnetic nerve trees for a sensor array that are also in the suit. And finally, in a number one, the Joker. Mad Love is one of the most beloved episodes of Batman the Animated Series, but the story of the episode was first told in the show's tie-in comic, The Batman Adventures. The story provides an in-depth look into Harley Quinn's origin and the full extent of her abusive relationship with the Joker. After her anniversary plans end with her being thrown out of a window by Mr. J, she decides that the only way to win her Puddin's affection is to capture and kill Batman. And she succeeds, well, at capturing. But Joker isn't happy about that. If anyone's gonna take Batman down, it's going to be him. And he lashes out at Harley once again, leaving him alone with the Dark Knight. Batman and Joker then fight, obviously, but Batman's able to use Harley's successful scheme to his advantage, taunting the Joker that she came closer than he ever has to actually killing him, and concluding this joke by calling him Puddin, which is one of the funniest things I think Batman has ever done. Being usually a brooding and dark hero who still refuses to kill despite his darkness, calling his greatest enemy by his girlfriend's pet name is one of the best moments for Batman ever. Number 10, Cyborg. In Injustice Gods Among Us number 15, Cyborg, Wonder Woman, and Superman go to Arkham Asylum to move its prisoners to Superman's quote unquote secure facility. Cyborg takes control of the asylum security and begins opening cell doors for Flash to whisk away the prisoners inside. When he is about to open the Riddler's cell, Batman gives him a little warning not to, which Cyborg ignores. All it takes is one button on Batman's utility belt and Cyborg's systems go haywire. He falls to the ground, writhing in pain, until Nightwing steps in and presses the button again. It turns out that after Cyborg checks the date of the virus that caused this, Batman had uploaded the virus the very first day the two met, and he's had it the whole time. An easy little button press and he takes down an extremely advanced Cyborg. Number 9, Green Arrow. In the deceased storyline, when an anti-life virus is spreading throughout the globe and infects Superman, Damian Wayne, the Batman at the time, gets access to Bruce's files around around taking down the Justice League. The funniest and most embarrassing thing though is that when Green Arrow assumes there's a file with his name on it, Damien informs him that there isn't. Batman didn't have a single file for Green Arrow. He didn't even see Green Arrow as a real threat. Bruce is dishing out the embarrassments even beyond the grave. But Green Arrow could be a planetary threat if he wanted to. Wait a minute, you know what would be really embarrassing? If you didn't like and subscribe to our channel. Kidding, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Number eight, The Hulk. Bet you didn't expect to see this on the list. Honestly, who would? I know who. Anyone who knows that Batman is Batman, that's who. In 1981's DC Special Series number 27, Batman comes upon the rampaging green rage monster. The Joker had tricked Hulk into believing Batman was an enemy. The Hulk ended up getting the Dark Knight in a bear hug, where he almost broke the bat's back. Batman busts out of it and uses a knockout gas. But Hulk ain't that dumb, and he just holds his breath. Until Batman kicks him straight in the stomach, winding the green giant and causing him to breathe in. Yeah, it's probably unrealistic as hell, but it's a man that fights criminals in a bat suit fighting a guy that turns into a giant green monster because of gamma rays from a bomb. So tell me how that's realistic. Number seven, 
Green Lantern. First off, Justice League War is an awesome animated DC movie. We see the Justice League come together for the first time. In one of the first interactions between Green Lantern and Batman in a sewer, there's a bit of banter between Hal and Bruce when Hal realizes that Batman is literally just some guy in a bat costume. And he asks, what, no one asked you to prom so now you just dress as a bat and prowl around your parents basement? Batman, in response, simply just pauses and then asks, what's this do? As he holds up the Green Lantern's ring. It makes me genuinely chuckle. But then, when Green Lantern tries to tell him that he won't be able to do that again, Batman just hits him with, unless I want to, what a boss. Number 6. Green Lantern Again, in All-Star Batman and Robin The Boy Wonder, Green Lantern gets shown up. In order to face Hal Jordan, Batman lures him into a room where he has painted literally everything yellow. Why? The Green Lantern ring has the unfortunate weakness of not being able to affect anything yellow. So all the furniture, his and Robin's costumes, even their faces, and to top it all off, he even taunts Green Lantern while drinking lemonade. To really top it off, Batman isn't even the one to fight the lantern. He leaves that to his ward, Robin, who admittedly takes it a bit too far. Number five, okay, one last Green Lantern defeat. Now, before you jump on me for including three times he's embarrassed the Green Lantern, you should know that one, I don't even like Green Lantern that much, and two, this time it was Guy Gardner, who is arguably the most annoying one. In 1987's Justice League number five, or Justice League International number five, Guy Gardner is his his usual cocky, jerkish self. And a conflict between him and Batman has been brewing for a few issues, with Guy just kind of being a huge pain in the butt. But when Guy finally rears back to throw his punch, the Dark Knight is in there so fast, punching this guy so hard he knocks him clean out. And then him and the rest of the league leave him on the floor while they continue planning and even go on missions. Then he doesn't even come to until like two issues later when he just accidentally knocks himself back out. Number four. Punisher. Punisher slash Batman Deadly Knights is a very short lived confrontation between these two heroes occurs when Batman stops Punisher from killing the Joker, which as we know goes against Batman's ideology. He interrupts the Punisher, coming in between him and his gun, and telling the Joker to run. In his frustration, Punisher drops his pistol and gets one mean punch in across Batman's face. Just the one though, as Batman lets him know he will only allow that one. Seeing how the Punisher probably thinks Bruce deserves it, it really gets embarrassing when Mr. Castle goes for a second swing and Batman redirects the punch in one move, sending the Punisher face first into a pile of boxes stacked up against a brick wall. When Batman tells you you only get one, you best believe him. Number three. Justice Buster Armor. In the end game story, the Joker has twisted the other members of the Justice League with his Joker toxin, meaning we get to see Batman take them all on. While we know he has contingencies for each member of the League, Batman instead dons an armor, an armor that has the capability to subdue every member of the Justice League, the Justice Buster. Using this suit, he puts Wonder Woman in a dream state, maps out the Flash's movements and causes him to slip and crash into a building, knocking him out. He fires a foam made up of magnesium carbonate at Aquaman that envelops him and drains him of the moisture in his body the more he struggles. And then Superman shows up. The Justice Buster has plasma shields to deflect eye beams, thrusters and thermals to deter frost breath, but this is a Superman that isn't pulling his punches. When Superman gets through this armor, it doesn't matter though. Batman spits a polymer laced with green kryptonite dust into Superman's eyes, rendering him powerless. Number two, beating Superman as an old man. In the exceedingly famous Dark Knight Returns story, we see what is arguably one of the best Superman versus Batman fights to ever grace comics. In the last issue, number four, pits an aged Bruce Wayne against a Superman that has become a puppet of the government. Superman has been weakened by a nuclear explosion. He's been hit by hunter missiles, shot from a tank, shot with a sonic gun that makes his nose bleed. Batman uses every watt of the city's power to electrocute Superman's brain. Batman then socks Superman straight across the face a few times, shoots acid in his face, and after being hit with a green kryptonite arrow, Superman takes a studded boot to the jaw before Batman seemingly dies of a heart attack. Even at 55, he left Superman battered and bleeding, and the whole thing was just a ruse. Well played. Number one, 
He put all the other heroes to shame. Of all the insanely powered heroes in the DC Universe, Batman is the last person you or I think could pose a threat to Darkseid. So it's kind of embarrassing for every other hero that has lost to Darkseid when in the final crisis event, Bruce Wayne simply shoots Darkseid with a radion bullet, killing him. Just like that. Yeah, he had the element of surprise because not a single soul thought he could pull off anything like that. Not even Superman could defeat Darkseid here. What makes it better is that it's not the only time he has beaten the God of Death. That's why you don't underestimate Batman, y'all. And it's in The Flash. Red Death is a speedster that is an evil combination of Batman and The Flash, which already sounds terrifying, but his story is, is really humiliating when you think about it. The Bruce Wayne of Earth-52 started off fighting crime with Robins, but they kept dying left, right, and center, obviously, but mostly because of uh, voter call-ins. So understandably, Batman got darker and darker, becoming more extreme with his methods, and he just basically started killing every one of his villains, which honestly seems more realistic to me. Like maybe instead you just you, you quit fighting crime, but you know beggars can't be choosers. This eventually leads him to Barry Allen, who refuses to give Bruce his speed force powers for understandable reasons. So Batman then uses his various rogues weapons to fight Barry and knocks him out. Once Barry was unconscious, Bruce tied him to the front of a cosmic treadmill powered Batmobile and drives them both into the speed force. When entering the speed force, Barry and Bruce end up fusing together into one being and they turn into a evil Batman with super speed and a lust for killing, while Barry's mind is trapped inside of Bruce's body. Now some of you may not consider this humiliating, but I think it counts because like I'd classify that as pretty embarrassing getting locked inside someone else's body when they're using your superpowers. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll at least put it in number 10. In at 9, Lord Death. Lord Death was a secondary villain that has not appeared too many times in the comic books. He also has a rather peculiar ability. He can't actually die. Whenever he's on the verge of death, Lord Death will actually enter a trance-like state and resurrect himself. How does one stop an enemy that can always come back no matter how many times you kill him, you ask? Well, the answer for Batman at least was a rocket but seemingly not a bat rocket, which is hella unfortunate. Batman straps Lord Death to a rocket and then sends him up into space. Yeah, where the guy ends up spending all of eternity floating in the cold vacuum of ever expanding space. <laughs> Beating someone who is named Lord Death that can resurrect himself is, is kind of already like kind of a flex, but when you're just a mere mortal man, and then you do it, it seems like it would be pretty humiliating if you ask me. It would have been more humiliating though, if it was Batman using the Bat Rocket to send him into Bat Space for the rest of Baternity. I, I apologize for all the Bat puns, I know it was a bat of a stretch, but I have to get my daily pun quota out there somehow. In at 8, Green Lantern Corps. In Dark Knight's Metal, we see a very dark version of Batman from an alternate universe within the Dark Multiverse. In that universe, Batman was given a Green Lantern ring. Batman has indomitable willpower, so he was deemed worthy by the ring, which is actually pretty understandable. The power ring came with some protocols though that ensured that no Green Lantern could ever misuse the most powerful weapon in the universe. Batman not only broke those protocols with his will, but he also outsmarted the entire Green Lantern Corps that had come to stop this rogue lantern. So I think it's safe to say this is pretty damn humiliating for the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps because Batman defeated every lantern that came to stop him. But he had enough willpower to actually break the willpower of the ring and then he was able to use it for nefarious means. Like that feels like it would be like a, a, the ultimate kick in the gonads. And at least like if lanterns themselves had gonads. Can like the collective consciousness of the Green Lantern Corps just like manifest like a giant sack for Batman to kick? Because at, at this point that's what he did. And it's seven crazy quilt. After his eyes were injured in a robbery, Crazy Quilt underwent an experimental procedure which resulted in him seeing nothing but blindingly bright color. This of course somehow turned him into an insane criminal. How insane? Well, first of all, he tried to steal color itself, which no one ever figured out how he planned to do. And second of all, his um his powers were basically constantly having a um Illicit substance trip, that is an acronym, that, that is like LED, which affects literally no one but himself. Even when Crazy Quilt got a helmet that allowed him to project his like crazy eye color lights at people, all Batman and Robin needed to do was like turn a mirror on him and reflect the beam back. And he was he was done. In all honesty, I don't, I don't even think Batman needed to do much here to actually embarrass him. I mean like the dude calls himself Crazy Quilt. I think that says enough. 
Like, I don't know a single person who is scared of quilts. Like, what do you think this name is gonna do? And if even if he didn't name himself, I feel like it, that just adds an extra layer to it, you know? Like, why do you think that they called you Crazy Quilt? Because you want to steal color? No, it's because you're bad crazy and don't scare anyone. And at six, the Gotham mob. Batman's you have eaten well speech from year one may just be the most iconic moment in Batman history. It's the definitive Batman moment in the definitive Batman origin, as the Dark Knight formally announces his presence to the Gotham underworld with an entrance that the Kool-Aid man would have been very proud of. After blowing up the dining room wall of a Gotham mansion where Carmine Falcone was hosting a get together with the big criminals of the city, including GCPD Commissioner Loeb, the Dark Knight proceeds Proceeds to deliver an all-timer of a monologue, vowing that from this moment on none of you are safe, before extinguishing the last light in the room and leaving in hushed silence. Prior to this sequence, every single mobster and crook in that room thought themselves to be untouchable, but in one fell swoop, Batman eliminates any sense of security that they may have had and brings them crashing back down to Earth. It's one of the most iconic Batman moments of all time, incredibly intimidating, and considering how the whole mob was just bested by one man, pretty embarrassing. Halfway through into number five, Condiment King. I think this is pretty obvious. I mean like, Condiment King was meant to be an embarrassing villain. But the first meeting between him and Batman in Batman the Animated Series is absolutely amazing. The Condiment King first appeared in the episode Make Him Laugh, voiced by Stuart Pankin. He was whimsical and made many condiment-based puns. For example, the big bad bat guy, I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later. How I relished this meeting. You, the dynamic Dark Knight versus me, the conceptual Condiment King. Come, Batman, let's see if you can cut the mustard. However, Batman wasn't down for games. Since, as Condiment King said, cut the mustard, Batman just punches him in the gut. Much to Condiment King's surprise, he falls down and was like, you punched me! Like, yeah, of course he did. And then Batman proceeds to tell him point blank, look, mustard man, or whatever you call yourself, obviously you're new at this, so I'll go easy on you as long as you give back the loot and promise never to try this again. To which the Sultan of Sauces, he, he slips on ketchup and falls off the balcony he was standing on, grabbing onto a neon sign to save his life. So yeah, definitely deserving of this list. In it for the Riddler. Last time I talked about a specific instance in which Batman taunts Nigma in front of Green Arrow, but Batman literally solving any riddle that Nigma sends his way is pretty much always humiliating. Like every single time Nigma thinks that he's come up with like the most genius thing or that Batman will never solve it or at least he thinks it will be a tough time solving it and then Batman solves it and Nigma is just left defeated. Like I know it's not like in, in the typical sense embarrassing but I feel like at this point like the Riddler should have just like given up okay he's been beaten so many times. He's the condiment king of the recognizable and popular rogues. He doesn't really do much but he's there to kind of like toy with you until like you know the world's greatest detective actually uses his brain you see if the Riddler had revealed the whole three Joker thing instead of the Mobius chair with a riddle okay that would have been something but instead he's like a walking fudgesicle stick he doesn't really need Batman to embarrass him he does it on his own although I haven't seen the Batman yet so maybe he's better in that movie getting close to the end in number three Dr. Death Dr. Death aka Dr. Carl Helfern is historically the first supervillain encountered by Batman in his first appearance in Detective Comics number 29, Dr. Death develops a lethal chemical agent from pollen extract and enacts a plan to use the poison to extort money from Wealtham Gotham City citizens. In an attempt to evade capture by Batman, Dr. Death ignites chemicals in his laboratory, presumably killing Jabba, his partner, and himself in the resulting explosion. He comes back in the next issue with the same plan, but Batman intervenes in the plot and upon apprehending the doctor, discovers that Dr. Death's face is horribly disfigured from the lab explosion, resulting resulting in his whole body having a brown skeletal appearance. But that doesn't stop Batman from basically dismembering this guy in Batman number 29 from 2011, where he just absolutely kicks the c out of this hideous creature, saying, let me help you with that, this is when I hurt you, and then proceeds to help snap his bones. So yeah, this is like the second worst thing that happened to Helfern, the first being looking like that. 
<laughs> Penultimately, in at number two, Lex Luthor. Close on the heels of the incident of No Man's Land, where Lex Luthor tried to unsuccessfully take over the city of Gotham, the DC villain was so angry at Bruce Wayne for ruining his project that he actually cooked up a plan to put Bruce behind bars. Lex approached David Kane, who was upset at Bruce for another reason, and enlisted him to make sure that Bruce would be the main suspect for the murder of Vesper Fairchild, who the millionaire had been seeing for a while. It's actually a plan that works too, for Bruce is eventually arrested for a crime that he didn't commit. It takes Bruce nearly a year to clear his name, but once he does, he gets Lex back in one of the most incredible ways that someone has beat Lex. Batman shows up, beats Luther down, and then tells him, quote, You are penniless, Luther. As of this morning, Bruce Wayne owns this property, and he wants you out of the building. Considering how Luther's whole identity is wrapped around trying to beat heroes using his tech, losing that tech to Bruce Wayne buying out his building definitely would put a bad taste in his mouth. And finally, in at number one, Bane. Of all the characters that have broken Batman, Bane is arguably the one who did it the most successfully because he actually broke, broke him. Everyone loves to talk about the backbreaking beatdown delivered during Nightfall, but the build up to that saw the masked mercenary preside over the Dark Knight's complete psychological breakdown as well, as he was forced to negotiate a mass breakout of Arkham Asylum and Blackgate Penitentiary. The two would have had their brushes in the following years, but their feud was taken to a whole other level during Tom King's run of Batman in 2016. In that series, Bane had to become dependent on the Psycho Pirate in order to kick his addiction to Venom. Batman also needs the Psycho Pirate though, in order to help Gotham Girl, so he assembles a team along with Catwoman to go to Santa Prisca to abduct him. Bane and Batman fight once again, which actually ends up leading to Bruce suffering another spine related injury, only for the Dark Knight to deceive Bane by faking a Catwoman double cross, which allows the feline fatale to then break Bane's back and complete their plan. So yeah, Bane got his back broken. I mean, Batman didn't do the one that wasn't the one who did the kicking in this instance, but still, he helped. Okay? It's good enough for me.